Welcome to Celebration. Ready or not, we're going to start. In fact, Ready or Not is our series title. Ready for heaven? Ready for Jesus to come back? Are you uh, ready to face Jesus, even as a Christian? Are you ready for the persecution that's coming? Uh, we've already got some. It's going to get worse. People in other nations are already thinking, man, it can't get much worse, can it? Uh, there's lots of things to be ready for. Be ready for the opportunities. Are you ready for the opportunities to do good things for the Lord? Uh, obviously, if ready or not is the question, we need to be ready. And that's what the book of 1 Thessalonians is all about. Uh, we're into the, actually the ninth sermon now of our series in chapter 4. But before we read it, uh, let me point out that it's also uh, 4th of July weekend. And so we're celebrating as a nation our freedom. And one of those freedoms, and I think it's the most important of all, is the freedom of religion. That our government is not supposed to be able to tell us one way or the other how we are to worship or not and cannot encroach upon that. And the reason that's so important is that it gives us the freedom then to reach out to others and try to tell them about Jesus and uh, do things in service and love toward them that they might see Jesus in us. And therefore, more people get saved, more people get ready for eternity. And so as you celebrate the fourth, celebrate the greatest freedom, and that is the freedom to be who God wants you to be, because that's what it's all been about. In that, then it's going to change the relationships you have with people, and that's what we're talking about today uh, in sermon number nine. All of them have begun with the letter P, and this one is peaceful relationships. We just finished reading uh, the first part of Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 4, and where Paul talked about and last week's message was about uh, sanctification, a process by where God is uh, working in us to help us to be more like Jesus, more and more and more. And uh, if you're saved, if you're truly a part of the church, the body of Christ, he's working on you to be better, and that's going to affect and should affect how we relate to other people because we should be more like Jesus and see how he related. So as he goes into verse 9 then of chapter 4, we start learning about these uh, peaceful or hopefully peaceful relationships that we're to cultivate and do. Uh, let me say this up front as well. The Bible also talks about the fact that even though you try to live peaceably, sometimes it's not going to work. I mean, after all, they killed Jesus, right? I mean, the Prince of Peace, and they killed him. Uh, the Apostle Paul, they cut his head off. Uh, disciples were crucified. They were uh, beaten to death. They were dragged to death. They were speared to death. Uh, that doesn't sound like real peace to me. But the reason is because some people just will never make peace with God. They don't want it. They reject that. And if you live like Jesus, some people will never have peace with you. Uh, you can't have peace with everybody. But the Bible tells us that the wisdom of God is first pure, then peaceable. So we must be standing on the truth of God and have purity of what we believe. And then it also says, as much as it depends on you, live at peace with others. As much as it depends on you. Let it never be said that the reason we're not at peace is because of me. That I'm blowing it. That I've messed up. That I'm not living right. That I'm treating you wrongly. And that's what we want to cure is how we respond to it, that we do things right according to God, according to his word, and then we can have peace with others that are doing the same and hopefully include more in that. So let's read the verses 9 through 12 of First Thessalonians 4 and talk about these peaceful relationships. So Paul said about brotherly love, you don't need me to write you because you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. In fact, you are doing this toward all the brothers in the entire region of Macedonia. But we encourage you, brothers, to do so even more, to seek to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your own hands as we commanded you, so that you may walk properly in the presence of outsiders and not be dependent on anyone. So in these few verses... Uh, Paul talks about our relationships within the church and outside of the church, people to people, and how that we might live peacefully as best as we can. Uh, and then in these relationships, hopefully we include more people. So let's break it down and see uh, what he's actually mentioning here in these few verses about how that we might be 
uh, the peaceful part of these relationships. And the first thing he said was that we would love God's family. Now, we know from other scriptures that we're supposed to love everybody. In fact, we talked about that uh, in the last couple of messages, that we are to spread that love out. But specifically here, he narrows down to the family and says, love the brothers and love each other. And he says, you're doing that, but do it even more. And so I want to just point out a couple of things here as, as he talked about that love that these uh, Christians in Thessalonica had uh, for each other, that's locally. So he's talking about love God's family, first of all, near and then far, uh, both places. It's, it's important that you love the church family that you're, you're with. I mean, that's who you're bumping into Sundays and Wednesdays and through the week as you do projects and ministries and stuff. And if we don't love one another, the world's going to see that. Jesus was very clear that that's how they're going to know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Not even so much loving them, but loving ourselves. And here we live in an age in America where churches uh, split, divide, fall apart, uh, dissolve. And not too much of it's really about doctrine and about Bible uh, theology and stuff like that. It, it comes down to not loving each other and not getting along with one another. And it's often over petty stuff, uh, but we're not showing the love. And so... You start talking to the world about God's love, and they say, well, I don't see it in your church. I don't see it in your people. I, I see and hear you talking about each other negatively and treating one another unfairly and unjustly. And they got a point if that's the kind of life you live. On the other hand, you could be outside of the local church when you claim to be in it. And what I mean by that is if you're a Christian and claim to be, you're supposed to be involved in the local church. You are a part of the body of Christ. We've talked about it a lot. If they see that you're not doing that, then you're already throwing a bad light. We'll talk about that more later. But the point is, love your local church family. Stand up for them. Support them. Back them. As much as is in you, make sure the problems are not because you caused them, as we love God's family, near and then far. Paul said, you're loving people all over Macedonia, all around. Uh, how, how would he know that? How could he know that they love people? Well, it's not just a feeling. That's our other point of loving God's family. It's not just that I feel good about them or that I feel love because you can't see that. You say, well, yeah, I can see the smile on your face, or I can see the wink, or I can see the hug. I can see the things that you do. That's my point. Those are actions. For me to just say I love you, first of all, that's an action. I said it, and I better do that, or you may not ever get a clue. <laughs> In fact, God would say, if there's no actions, you're not loving it's an action word. So obviously, because the Bible is so filled with the things that we are to do for one another and with one another, that when Paul says, I'm seeing it, I'm hearing about it, he has to be talking about actions. There's no other way. You can't just sit in Thessalonica in town and feel love for all of Macedonia and people know that. There has to have been actions and Paul got wind of that. He sent Timothy back. Timothy talked and traveled around and found out what was going on, came back with a good report. And Paul's saying, so I'm not going to tell you to do it. I'm going to tell you to do it more. You're doing it. You're not just feeling it. You're doing it near and far. You're putting your love into action. And that's what we must do to have these peaceful relationships with people. That's a loving relationship. This is my family. I stand up for my family. I back my family. I support my family. I help my family. I work with my family as we do God's work together. And we need to do it all so far. Now, that's getting harder to do. It's getting a little harder to do. It looks different now to do international missions, and, and it may be more difficult, but it's still demanded. And we've got to find ways and maybe get creative at how we can do love actions with people we can't even get to anymore. Uh, the pandemic shut it down for a while. It's slowly coming back, uh, but it's more expensive. It makes it tougher. How do we get the people away from the local body? Because we have to love them too. Let's get together and figure it out. We've got to find ways to do that because we're to love the family everywhere that the family is. Love God's family. He said, this is God's word we're talking about. Notice that he said, 
I, I don't really need to tell you about this. I'm going to tell you to do it even more because God told you to. This isn't just Paul's encouragement. It isn't just the preacher here saying we need to love one another and that takes action. That's what God says. And so if you're going to be one of God's kids, put your love into action. Do God's word. If we do that, a part of that's going to tell us the next thing, and that is to look to your own business. He said, mind your own business, work with your hands, take care of things. Uh, in other words, don't be a burden to the church. Now, we all need help sometimes. We just do. Uh, we get in a mess, and uh, we, we get ailments, we get diseases, we get problems, we get laid off, we get in a bind. Uh, there are many reasons why we're going to need somebody else to help us, but that ought to be short term for most of us. And he's saying here that don't be a burden to the church by having the church have to take care of your business when you can. So he's talking to those who are able. And if you're able, there's plenty of work out there. I'm constantly hearing from businesses and people and business owners, you can't get anybody to do any work. They want all the handouts. And so businesses are going under. They're having to close down hours because they don't have enough help. And it's short. We can't get medical things taken care of because they don't have enough help because people don't want to do any work, but they still want everything. And Paul said, we can't have that in the church. You can't be a burden to the church. If you can do stuff, do it. Get a job, go to work. But then there's another part. You also have to do the work of money management. You can't just make the money and then blow it how you want to and then come back to the church and say, now i got to have help. Don't expect the family, God's family, to buy your groceries because you spend it all at Disney World. It just doesn't work that way. You've got to do the work of stewardship as well. The Bible is filled with being stewards. In fact, it says that's the very thing we're supposed to do is be stewards for God. And the one thing he demands is that we be faithful stewards. So you need some priority set. You need some money management. The church can help you with that if you'll just be honest and say, you know what, I'm making a living, but I'm blowing it somehow because I'm always needing help. Let us help you. It's the old story of, you know, if you buy a fish dinner, you feed the guy once. But if you teach him to fish, then you can feed him for a lifetime. If you're willing to work, then also do the work of stewardship, proper use of your money. I'm not saying you don't deserve a little break now and then. Maybe everybody gets a vacation. But where do you take it and how much do you spend? All that is work. <laughs> money managing. But then there's another part to this. Look to your own business. You see, if... You're a Christian, you're a part of the church, and therefore you have to do part of the church's business. Help build the kingdom. That's part of your business if you're a Christian. Don't leave that up to the professionals or don't leave that up to those who've already been in it. Don't leave that up to somebody else in the church. Go to your pastor, go to your deacons, go to your trustees, go to your Sunday school directors or your discipleship leaders and say, how can I get involved? Do you need workers in Bible school? Do you need workers and counselors at camp? Do you need uh, people to help with the, the kitchen and the setup for programs and all that stuff? Because I'm willing to do the work. I'm willing to do my part. The Bible's clear about that, that we're all supposed to put in our part. So when it says look to your own business to do your own work with your hands, it isn't just your business because God has made his work your business too. He said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and the other things, the things you're working for, food and clothing and shelter and that, God says, I'll provide those. But you've got to look to my business. Don't be a burden on the kingdom. Build the kingdom. This is God's work. Just like loving is God's family and God's word, then looking to your own business is God's work. Building, helping to fulfill God's work. He's called you to it, and he says, look to your own business. Naturally, all of these are God's Word as well, but it's also God's work then. Get in the Word, read the Word, you find out that you're not supposed to be a burden and you're supposed to help build the kingdom, so get busy and do your part. Kind of simple, sounds like to me, and yet so many are lacking it. Uh, I've been in the business a long, long time, and I've never seen much different than 20% of the people in the church do most of the work. Why is that? 
Well, there might be another 10 or 20 percent who no longer can physically do some of it. But you still got half or more who could, but they're building their own kingdom. You say, well, you just told me I'm supposed to do my work. I'm supposed to take care of myself. Yeah, but part of that is to take care of the kingdom business as well. And so you're only doing half your job. We got to get busy in God's word and in God's work. And as we do that, this next one should be easier, and that's to live respectably. Uh, one author that I was reading said to live creditably. That's even harder to say, but don't give uh, any reproach to the gospel. Don't live your life in a way that when people see your life, they say, well, I thought he was a Christian. I, I thought he claimed to know Jesus. I, I thought he loved God and, and loved people. Why, why does he live like that? We bring reproach on the gospel when we don't live according to that. We, we take credit away from the gospel when we're not living. Now, we're not perfect. I don't claim to be. If you knew me very well or know me very long, you'll, you'll know I'm not. But we're supposed to be working at that. That's part of our own taking care of business, too, is to work toward being respectable in the kingdom. Some of it is just getting busy and doing the work. Read the Bible. Study it. Pray. Worship, get involved in the church, and you'll become more respectable because you won't have the time to be doing all the other stuff. You're not building your own kingdom anymore. You're building God's kingdom. And as you get busy to do the work of that, you just find that you get to be more and more and more like Jesus. And that doesn't bring reproach on the gospel. That spreads it. And so don't let people look into the gospel and say, whoa, wait a minute. What about this guy? What about this lady? What about this boy? What about this girl? Uh, their, their language is tearing down the work of the gospel. Their, their attitudes, their actions. I thought they were supposed to be Christians. Never let that be said about you. I thought he was a Christian. Why would they say that? Because they've heard something, seen something, found out some things that bring reproach to the gospel. If we don't do that, then we'll also give a good reputation for the church. That's just bringing it back to more local all Christians ought to uh, exemplify the gospel message, not bring reproach to it. But locally, then that's going to reflect on the church, and we should have a good re reputation there. Uh, so many times over the years in the ministry as I've gone out uh, into the community, especially when I'm new to a community or new to a church, and then I go out and start to call on people and introduce myself and such as that, uh, Boy, it just hardly ever fails that they come up with somebody who belonged to that church that did them dirty in business uh, or that has a bad reputation in the community. And so here I am trying to get them to come to visit my church, and they're saying, you got church members who don't even need to be there. Well, we all need to be there, but a good reputation for the church. I jokingly say this often with my church folks, but they also know I kind of mean it a little bit, and that is I tell them, you know, that they need to be good. I'm going to be gone for a week, so be good. If you can't be good, be careful. And then I say, if you can't be careful, tell them you go to church somewhere else. Tell, tell them you're a Methodist or Presbyterian. We happen to be Baptist. So I don't want them, I don't want them to know that you're from my church if you're going to have a bad reputation in the community. Uh, we're a part of the family. Do you really want to destroy your family? Do you really want to bring reproach to Jesus and to your church, which is the rest of your body? No, live respectably. And, and he calls us to this. He says, live a quiet life. He, he said that, uh, you know, you do your own business, work with your own hands, so that you may walk properly in the presence of outsiders. We've already talked about loving the brothers and, and helping the people in our own church. But as we walk in front of the world out there, he says we need to walk properly, not be dependent on them uh, for anything, not have a bad reputation that, well, you know, he defaulted on a loan and uh, he lost his business because he couldn't live up to, uh, he, he cheated people and it came back to get him. And we can't have that. It brings reproach to the gospel and bad reputation for our church. And where else are people going to get the truth except from the church? Not going to get it from the movie industry and television industry. Not going to get it from the major news sources. You're not going to get it from the government. You're not going to get it from the public school system. Where else are you going to get it but from individuals? And individuals make up the church. That we hear the truth 
about Jesus Christ and who he is and how we're to have a relationship with him. And that relationship works in me to produce in me the kind of character that Christ has, which means I'll have that kind of relationship with other people and in front of a world who really doesn't want it, but if they see it, they may want it. On the surface, they don't want to know about Jesus, and they don't want to trust him, and they don't want to believe in God. But as that doesn't work out for them, and it never will, uh, maybe they begin to have second thoughts and say, you know what, uh, maybe there is something to this idea about God and, and eternity, and maybe I need to be thinking about that. And they need to know that there's a group of people locally that's living it right, right in front of them, because they have a good reputation. Oh, they're not perfect, and everybody will know that, but they're consistently trying to be like Jesus. Live respectably, that you not bring any reproach on Jesus or on your church. And then Paul says, if you'll do that, then you'll lack nothing. Now, we know he can't be saying here that you can have anything you want. Uh, that's just not Bible. Uh, everything in the Bible has to, to jive with the rest of it. Uh, it's one book, and you can't just pick things out and, and make it say what you want to. And there's so much in the Bible about the fact that uh, we're not to desire the things of the world. But we're not to live for the stuff. Life does not consist in the abundance of things, Jesus said. And we're not supposed to be uh, property-driven and possession-driven that we're supposed to be uh, driven by God. Jesus said it in the Sermon on the Mount. As he started his ministry, he kind of laid the ground rules here, and he said, seek first the kingdom of God. We already mentioned that earlier as we talk about building the kingdom. That ought to be our heart's desire, to do God's business, to do God's work, to touch people's lives and get involved there. Uh, the business of our church has always been, I hope it always will be, uh, the same as what ought to be our individual thing, and that is to reach and develop people for Jesus. That's why we're still here. Otherwise, he would have just saved me, taken me to heaven. But he's got a job for us to do, and we're to take care of that business, and part of that's to live respectably. And if we do that, seeking God's kingdom, he says, I will provide your needs. My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory, Paul wrote in the letter to the Philippians, that we're to be about the Father's business. Jesus said that when he was 12 years old. Remember the story where uh, they had been in Jerusalem for the feast? The, the family caravan headed home, and it took them a couple days to figure out Jesus wasn't with the other family members. And so they left him. And so they went back to Jerusalem and searched high and low for him and finally found him in the temple courts, talking to the uh, elders of the, the Jewish synagogue about God's business. And they kind of started to get on him about being lost here. Well, he wasn't lost. <laughs> he knew where he was, and he said, didn't you realize I'd be about my father's business? And I'm supposed to be like Jesus. Don't I realize I'm supposed to be about my father's business? Don't you realize you're supposed to be going about doing the father's business? Seek the kingdom first. You say, well, but I got a job to do, and I got to take care of the family, and I got to do this. We already covered that. Take care of that. God will bless that if you help and build the kingdom. If you're going to be selfish, then he just let you have what you can do. But if you'll work for God, if you'll be a steward of everything that he's given you and blessed you with, he'll take care of things and you'll lack nothing. But a part of the key to that is that you be satisfied with kingdom life. You see, we lack nothing when we want the right things. Now, if you just want earthly things, you'll never really be satisfied. There's always another earthly thing. There's always a bigger earthly thing. There's always a better house, a faster car, uh, nicer clothes. Uh, there's always more entertainment to seek after. We need to have godly wants. We've talked about God's word, God's work, and I live respectively was about God's ways, but these are God's wants. The Bible says that if we would uh, put him first, if we would delight in the law of the Lord and, and put our delight in him, he would give us the desires of our heart. And I'm afraid that we have interpreted that to mean that if I just pay some attention to God, go to church a little bit and kind of dip my hand in the ministry a little bit here and there, that God's going to give me whatever I want. He's going to give me the desires of my heart. Well, first of all, that means that he will create in you proper desires. He will give you the desires 
then when I have the right desires because I'm seeking God's kingdom first and I want to know him and have a great relationship with him and I spend that time there when I'm seeking God and his kingdom, when that's the desire of my heart, then he also gives me that and he gives me the desires of my heart. Are you satisfied with kingdom life? Or is the world more appealing to you? I'm afraid for most of us, probably all of us at any given time, our heart's desires lean towards what the world is offering. And we've got to have our houses, and we've got to have our vehicles, and we've got to have the best, and we've got to have the entertainments. That's the worst part. We've got to have the games to play. We've got to have the sports. We've got to have the television and the movies. And by the time we do all of that and seek all that and spend our time with all that and pay for all that, there's not much less left to help us build the kingdom. And we're not all that concerned about building it because we don't have the time anyway because we've given it to what the world offers. Paul said he learned to be satisfied in any condition. He had learned and knew what it was like to have a little money, to have some wealth. He also knew what it was like to be flat broke. He knew what it was like to be filled with good food, and he knew what it was like to be hungry. He certainly knew what it was like to get persecuted and, and run out of town and have rocks thrown at him and whips taken to him and fists taken to him. He understood troubles, but he said, I'm satisfied with that if that's what God wants me to go through. Because I want to be more like Jesus, he said, and that's my goal in life, and so I'll do whatever it takes to be like Jesus, who pleased the Father by building the kingdom. Are you satisfied with the things that God offers? Are you satisfied with kingdom life here? Or do we want to build our own kingdom here because there's always more that the world's offering? I want to suggest to you that you're going to always be hungry. You're going to always be dissatisfied. You're always going to be reaching for more because none of that stuff lasts. Because God is in you if you're a Christian. And God wants godly stuff. And he wants godly people. And if he has his way in us, if we become satisfied with the things of God and seek more of those, so therefore we live respectably, we look to the business of it, loving our family, our God's family, and loving people, God's going to bless us. And those are going to be peaceful relationships. As we said in the beginning, there are going to be some people not like it, but you'll be at peace because you'll be doing what God wants you to do. You'll be what God wants you to be, and you'll be content with that, and you'll be at peace in your heart no matter what the world says and does about it, and you'll have peace with the rest of us that are doing the same thing. Most importantly, you'll have peace with God. I want to pray that we can have peaceful relationships, first of all with Him, and then secondly with each other in the kingdom. And then hopefully with enough people that we can bring more into the kingdom because they'll want what they see in us. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful, first of all, that you made peace with us through the blood of Jesus Christ as he sacrificed himself to pay for our sin. And you offered us salvation and a new life and an eternity with you. And so based on your word and our faith, uh, we have that. And we have peace with you. We want to have peace with one another. Those of us who know Jesus ought to be able to do that. We've got your love and your spirit in us. We've got your word to guide us. If we would surrender to that and do our part, we can live peaceful, peaceably with each other. Now, can we live and have a peaceful life of, with the world? I don't know, but we've got to live peacefully in front of them. And we've got to offer them that same thing. Help us to live respectable lives that bring honor and glory to you. And those who will come for it, we can help them. Those who choose to go away from you, that's your business. Help us live peaceful in our own heart and in our relationships with other people. And we do this all to your glory and in Jesus' name. Amen.